text 32. Putra nam duhitrinam cha kale vij yupayayanam dar arvayas tatsadrishai kalpayantam vibhutibi. Narada saw Lord Krishna engaged in getting his sons and daughters married to suitable brides and bridegrooms at the appropriate time, and the marriage ceremonies were being performed with great pomp. Purport. This translation is based on Srila Prabhupada's Krishna. The word kale here means that Krishna arranged for his sons and daughters to be married when each of them reached the proper age. So what is the proper age for marriage? 16. 16 for girls is maximum, and for boys, maximum is? 24. 24. 24, probably says maximum 24 for the boys, 16 for the girls. That's maximum, that's the oldest. Yes. So this means, of course, that the brahmachari ashram, we need to distinguish brahmachari from the brahmachari ashram. Just like Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati was a lifetime brahmachari, he was a lifetime celibate, but he did not remain in the brahmachari ashram his whole life. So the Brahmachari Ashram is for whom? Of how old? Children. For children and teenagers. Right. Uh, and most boys don't stay in the Brahmachari Ashram until 24, like Ramachandra married when he was 16. So Mahaprabhu married at 14. So it's not the same as that uh, the f- um, according to Varna, Varna, they may stay the longer. The first 25 years was for the Brahmanas. Student. For the Brahmanas. Yes. I think of it like... 25. Well, well. I just like today we have a university education, secondary, and primary. Right. So it seems the university education was for the Brahmanas, secondary was for the Kshatriyas, and primary was for the Vaishyas. That's my guess. That the Vaishyas probably only went to school till they were like 10, and the Kshatriyas till they were like 15, and the, the Brahmanas till they were like 20, 25. But I mean, the stage of Ranasham, I mean, the 25, the, 25, the first 25 years, it's a student. one is student. But it couldn't be that for everybody because we have, again, Mahaprabhu gets married at 14. Right. Well, Ramchandra got married at 16. Uh, Bhakti Vinod was also 14. For Shudras, there's no Brahmacharya. For Shudras, there's no Brahmacharya. It's just Grihasta. But they obviously have get training in their trade. It's not that they get married when they pop out of the womb. So... And even for, for girls, they must have had some education. Again, I haven't seen any girl born in a wedding dress. So they had <laughs> people who think Grihastha is the only ashram. But it's, it's interesting that uh, the Brahmachari ashram is a school. It's training. It's education. The Brahmachari ashram is for basically children and teenagers. And some people are getting an undergraduate and a graduate degree. So some people are staying until they're 20, 25 years old. And by 24, 25 maximum, then the person should decide what should they decide? Whether to get married or not. Whether to get married or not. It has to be decided by at that time. You know, in modern society, people put the decision off and put it off and put it off and put it off. Stay a brahmachari as long as possible, as long as possible. But that's not the Vedic system. The Vedic system is not stay a brahmachari as long as possible. The Vedic system is stay a brahmachari your whole life or get married when you are young. 24 is maximum get married when you are young. So why, why young marriage? Because you have time to, I mean, time to retire from, from that. When, when the first ch- child is grown it's up. Grown up. Okay, so that's one big reason is that when you get to be in midlife, they call it the midlife crisis. So why is it a midlife crisis? It's a midlife crisis if you don't know what to do with it if you don't know what to do with it. It's like a friend of mine inherited a large amount of money, a devotee, and instead of being happy, she went into a crisis because she didn't know what to do with it. What do I do with this? What do I do with this money? What do I do with this money? So when you come to midlife, naturally you start feeling detached. Naturally. You come to midlife and you think, what did I do all this stuff for? What was, what was the use of my life? What was the use of my career and my family? And what was the use of all that? It's a natural thought happens in around midlife. Exactly like, exactly like the natural thought of, oh, that girl's pretty, or oh, that boy's handsome, happens if you're pretty. It's exactly the same. You hit puberty and all of a sudden you notice things you didn't notice before. Yes? 
Is this correct? All of a sudden, oh, look at that. <laughs> and the same thing happens at midlife, that all of a sudden you say, why am I working? What am I working for? Why am I running around so busy and active, doing and being and creating in the world? What's the use of that? What am I involved in this family life for? What's it, all, what's it for? So for the materialistic person, without a Varna system, uh, they just get depressed, they go to therapy, they get a new career, they get a new spouse. Yes? This is what happens at midlife. Oh, okay, I need a new husband, new wife, new career, whatever. But someone trained in the ashram system figures out, oh, time to take Vanapras. My, my mentality has changed, and therefore my ashram should change. So if you marry late, when that comes, you can't act on it. Because you didn't get married till you were 35 or 40. So your children are only six years old. And then the time naturally comes where you say, well, what is the use of all this? Kimasat Karmavir Bhavet. What is the use of all this stuff? But you can't. You have your responsibilities. And so it's, it doesn't work with the natural life cycle. What's some other reasons for young marriage? Yeah. And you have that kind of energy. So when you're young, you have a certain kind of energy. You have a kind of energy for making money, for doing things in the world. You have fertility of the body. Highest fertility of a woman is 18 to 20. For men, it's 20 to 22. So you're more likely to have children. You're more likely to have healthy children. You're, you already want to do something in the world. You already have that inclination. Let me go do something in the world. Let me make the world a better place. Let me make money. Like Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, I wanted to make a lot of money, so keeping in mind the codes of religions, I accepted a wife. So you have that kind of energy. What's another reason for young marriage? Yes. That's interesting, that you'd be an entirely, such an entirely different generation from your children if you have them when you're very old. That's interesting. Yes? Maybe I'm only speculating, but maybe they can learn how to, it's easier for them to learn how to control their senses and help each other. Yes, it actually is. Because then what you're doing is you're getting married at the time when your senses are actually peak of craziness. And then you can deal with that in marriage, and you're much more, easy to come, much more easily able to come to sense control. Whereas if you try to control your senses outside of marriage at that time, then it, it becomes, we see practically for our devotees, that it becomes much harder. Prabhupada gives another reason. He says that you can ban the bamboo when it's uh, green, but not when it's yellow. And that when people marry young, they can adjust to each other more easily. Once you're older and you already have, you know, each person already has their own house. We've seen this now in the West. The man already owns a house. The woman already owns a house. There's one family I know of where they got married older, and they each already owned their own houses, and they had to decide whose house were they going to move into. And it was they couldn't. They ended up having to buy a completely new house because when they tried living in the man's house, he wouldn't let his wife change it the way she wanted it. When they tried living in the woman's house, as she wouldn't let the man change it the way they, they wanted. So it's definitely much more difficult. Marriage is a big adjustment. It's a huge adjustment to living with another human being all the time. And so it's much easier to do that when you're young. Also, it uh, limits the extent of promiscuity in society. Definitely. It limits promiscuity and illicit sex in society. When are people having illicit sex in society? At, th at the time that they should be married. And because they're waiting till they're 35, 40 to marry, it's not that they're all just celibate sages. Well, as we see here on the streets of London. <laughs> okay. And another thing you see here on the streets of London, and I just saw this very clearly in Spain. By the way, if you guys think London is a party city, go to Spain. <laughs> oh, my God. Here, at least, they're quiet by 4 in the morning, yes? 3.34, they're quiet. In Madrid and Barcelona, it's going till 7 in the morning. Till 7 in the morning, they're partying. So how can you party all night if you've got a wife and kids, husband and kids? Can you do it? Much more difficult. It's possible, but it's much more difficult. 
You know, if, if you've got a job and you've got to maintain a family and you have children to take care of, are you going to be all, out all night partying? I don't think so. So where is this whole party scene coming from? It's coming from this delayed marriage, that you have a whole section of society that is what? What's the word? Starts with I-R. Irresponsible. irresponsible. They have no responsibilities. They're irresponsible. They're only responsible for themselves and to make money for themselves. And the ashram system is meant to teach responsibility. When you're a brahmachari, you're responsible to serve your guru. When you're a householder, you're responsible to serve your spouse, your children, and all of society. You give society good population and you give society good wealth. When you're vanaprastha and sannyas, you're again responsible to the society. You make the society your family. So Prabhupada says, the irresponsible life of sense gratification was unknown to the higher members of society in Vedic times. And he's specifically talking about the Varna system. So the Varna system is in tune with the life cycle. Basically, Varna means spiritualizing the life cycle. I mean, uh, ashram. Ashram means spiritualizing the life cycle. Varna means spiritualizing the career. So you take the natural life cycle of being a student, of wanting to earn money and having a romantic relationship, of wanting to retire and preparing for death. Those are the four natural stages that all human beings go through. And you spiritualize them. So Krishna is the ideal teacher, Yadyadatarji Shrestas. He got his sons and daughters married at the proper time. He did not say to them, oh, you know, first do this, first do that, first do this, first see the world, first get three PhDs, first buy a house, first have a career, first make a lot of money, first do this, first do that, and then get married. Even in terms of money, it's interesting that Prabhupada said he married when he was a third-year student. He said, what was the question of income at that time? But the families could understand that because I was getting an education, I'd be qualified to earn a living. And Prabhupada was shocked when he came to America and asked one Indian woman, oh, this is your son? Why isn't he married? And the woman said, well, I have no objection if he can maintain a family. And Prabhupada was shocked. He said, oh, maintaining a family is such a difficult job in the West that you're waiting and waiting and waiting to get your son married. So things should be done at the proper time. We'll mention this again a little later, but if you look at the modes of material nature as described in the Bhagavad Gita, a lot of what differentiates the higher modes from the lower modes is actions done at the proper time. Charity given at the proper time, sacrifice done at the proper time. So if, in the mode of ignorance, you do things at the wrong time. Wrong time, wrong place, wrong person, wrong motivation. In the higher modes, you know what is the proper time. So this is, this is a whole science like this. Like, why do we wake up early in the morning? You can chant Hare Krishna all the time. In fact, we should chant Hare Krishna all the time. But as far as a time for concentrated meditation, that is the proper time. And if you lose that time, you lose an opportunity. So in the same, these ashrams should be done at the proper time. And I would like in our Krishna consciousness movement that we start, as we're maturing as a society, that we start having a proper brahmacharya ashram. That by the time that somebody's 24, 25, that the ashram leader, the mentor, the guru, sits down with the devotee and says, okay, now you need to choose. Are you going to be a grahasta or are you going to be a vanaprasta? And that a few, like maybe one out of a thousand people, would actually stay in the brahmachari ashram. Staying in the brahmachari ashram means you're just a student like people who get, you know, three PhDs and do postdoctoral research. They never even teach. Brahmacharya is not a teacher. So they never even teach. And they're just firmly under the control of the guru. They don't eat unless their name is personally called. Whatever funds they get, they turn into the guru. They're a child. Uh, they're treated as a child. So most people don't want to live that way whole life. You see, even in the Christian tradition, the monks took this vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So there's some section of society that wants to live in a childlike state for their entire life and stay in the brahmacharya ashram. But Vedically, even the Nastika brahmacharis, they went on to become vanaprastha and sannyas. And I see that a lot of our lifetime brahmacharis are not really in the brahmachari ashram. They are less like we have Tattvavita just saw at the manor. He's not in the brahmacharya ashram. Who's telling him what to do every minute of the day? Yes? He's in the vanaprastha ashram. He's traveling to holy places. He has his own projects. Uh, Dravida Prabhu, of course, is like this. Druda Karma Prabhu, uh, Krishna Kshetra Prabhu. They're really in the Vanaprastha Ashram. And 
I would like to propose that I think it would be a great benediction for our Hare Krishna movement if those people who really are able to skip the Grahastha Ashram can be recognized as going on to the Vanaprastha Ashram and can start being given more responsibility and more independence and become empowered celibate single preachers. And instead of trying to keep people in the, in the ashram, in the Brahmacharya ashram, uh, which is not really psychologically sane for most adults. Yes? You can ask something now if it's brief, because I have another couple verses to go over. Well, Sankirtan is part of the Brahmachari life. To go out and distribute books and collect alms and give them to the guru is one of the main principles of the Brahmachari life. And of course, distributing books is for everybody in all of the ashrams. That's a transcendental bhakti activity. That's not just a varna, not just an ashram activity. But I see that many people who could stay Brahm Brahmachari in terms of celibate their whole life probably don't because they're not given the proper independence and facility to move on to the Vanaprastha ashram. And they may end up marrying not so much because they want a career and they want a, a, a wife or a husband, but because they want more independence in their service. And it'd be nice if we recognize that, that the Brahmachari ashram for 99.9% .9 of people should end by 24, 25. At that point, a person should make a decision. We shouldn't try to keep people in that ashram longer than that. And those who, who really have no interest in a career, which is Varna, and have no interest in a family and, and really, you know, very little sex desire, and they just, it's not their interest, it's not their propensity, they're much more interested in freedom, that then they should take the responsibility of saving the world, and they should take the responsibility of taking on some project and some uh, area in Mahaprabhu's mission. They should grow up. The Vanaprastha ashram is more independence than the Grahastha ashram. So to encourage pe people who are ready for that kind of independence, that we should encourage them in that. So just everything, that's not my main point of this class, but everything at the proper time, everything at the proper time. And when things are not done at the proper time, then it's hard to be in the mode of goodness, frankly. A lot of what makes something in the mode of goodness, or even passion, is that things are done at the proper time. So Krishna is setting this example. Yes. Mm. So then it should be brief. It should be brief. Just like in Hungary, they have a weekend program, and then you graduate, and then you can sign up for a two-week program, and then you graduate, and nobody encourages you to stay. Everybody says, here's your certificate. Now you've graduated. Jai, jai. And you have to reapply to go to the next program. It's not automatic. So they discourage people who are older from spending these years and years and years in training, unless they're really serious. And by five years of training, they really push people. After five years training maximum, that's the maximum, then they really push people. Okay, you must now make a decision. You must now make a decision. So if people come when they're older, it's also very helpful to have this, this time, not stay, stay in the ashram as long as possible, stay as long as possible, stay as long as possible. And then when people leave, they're, they're, break, they're breaking. And they see it as a fall down, and they see it as a, as a problem, and they're ashamed. And so they don't do the right thing at the right time because they're not encouraged to be honest. Now, honesty is the main component of spiritual advancement. The satam, here we have the satam, to be honest. So to say, okay, I'm, I'm in a new place now. My, my subtle body has changed, and, and I'm, ready for a new, I'm ready for a new phase in life. So I would humbly suggest that we do this even for the people who come older. Somebody comes, they're already 25. I really want this training. Okay, you know, really the training should end now, but we'll do a one-year program or two-year program. Because Prabhupada says to marry after 30 is not so pleasing. So certainly before 30. If somebody already comes in their 30s, I would say it should be very, very short time and say, you know, you really need to make a decision now. Which ashram do you want to go? And otherwise, the time is moving, and you won't be able to make the proper next step at the proper time. 
you'll be in the wrong place when it's time to make that step. What is the if he's not able to make up his mind? That's what we. That's what. The, what's the purpose of gurus and mentors and senior Vaishnavas? You know, it. <laughs> it reminds me of I was in one temple once where they asked me to give a class on uh, the last six chapters of Bhagavad Gita in a very, 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 very dirty room, where the bathroom smelled like an Indian train bathroom, and I told the managers I said I cannot teach about the modes of nature in this place, you know. We need to clean it. So they had hired cleaners, so the cleaners came and they just like did some superficial thing. And I said, I, you know, they have to be supervised. And they said, what's the use of having hired cleaners if you have to supervise them? I said, I don't know, but you have to supervise them. So if we have you know, mentors and gurus and seniors and still people can't make up their mind, what's the use of the mentors, gurus, and seniors? That's, that's what the mentors, the gurus, and the seniors are for. They're for helping people to find who they are and helping them to make up their mind and giving them deadlines and saying, you have a deadline. Just like Prabhupada talks about ending the grahasta ashram. He talks about a deadline. He said, just like in a shop. So I tell this story a lot. So I was, I was probably about seven, eight months pregnant. I had a two-year-old child. We only had one car. and My husband had the car at work. And we had to do something at the bank, and I don't remember why I was late, but I got to the bank at like 4.57. You know, and the door was already locked, and I'm standing there, I had to walk there, I'm standing there pregnant with my baby in a stroller, and they said, sorry, we're closed. I said, but it's 4.57, you have three more minutes. Sorry, we're closed. So it should be like that with the grahasta ashram, that you get to a certain age, the children are grown up, you're 50 or above, sorry, we are closed. The grahasta ashram is over. So this should be for each ashram, should you get to a point, you know, just like when I graduated from university, they didn't say, well, you can keep hanging around. <laughs> I mean, the saddest thing, it was actually really sad, was that my library card was only good for another six months. That was, I'm a book person. I used to own 4,000 books. So that for me was really sad because I couldn't access the academic journals anymore online. I mean, that was a, that was a real blow for me and, and my service. But you graduate, you're done. They take away your student ID card. They take away your library card. You're done, you're graduated. Get out of here. You know, just like the, the mother bird takes the baby birds and pushes them out. You're done. Goodbye. Go. What to speak of death? Right? When death comes, when it's time for to death, uh, um, I, I can't make up my mind what I want to think about, Krishna. Okay, it's time to go now. You're going to think about me? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, let me think about it a little more. Where do I want to go? Too bad. You have to make a choice. You follow? Too bad. Time's come. You have to make a choice. So we need to do this. We need to do this for people. Yes? There's not a thing for women. So sometimes people, they want to get into the session, but they don't know how to handle it because they're not trying to get a job, no career. Well, then that's part of what we have to do too. Yes? Prabhupada says in the second canto, that brahmachari ashram is for training in the values of life and specific training for a career. He says a brahmachari ashram is for specific training for a livelihood. Livelihood is varna. So one thing you're supposed to do in the brahmachari ashram is get specific training for your varna because most brahmachari, most people are going to go to the grahastha ashram. And for those who are not going to go to the Grahastha Ashram, then they get training for Vanaprastha life and eventually Sanyas life. That's the whole purpose of the Brahmachari Ashram is training. Prabhupada says it's training for the attached and for the detached. And if we're not giving that kind of training, my dear friends, we are not running a Brahmachari Ashram. We may be running something, you know. That's, it, it's not happening, it's gone. Well, let that, so why am I, that's why I'm talking about it. Um, the young devotees they want to, to live outside and well the temples wouldn't be empty in my useless opinion if we did things Vedically you know Vedic 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 what's Vedic 
Vedic is the brahmachari. Vedic isn't just that you wear a cloth you bought in Loy Bazaar. I mean, that's cool. But they, <laughs> that's okay. Giving some nice business to Ganga Prasad and his family. I mean, that's <laughs> so they could build a big mansion. But Vedic is essentially Varnashram. That is, if we want to show what's Vedic culture? Vedic culture is Varnashram. And what is Ashram? Ashram is proper thing at the proper time. And what is the Brahmacharya Ashram? The Brahmacharya Ashram is a school. It's training. It's training in being Krishna conscious that the goal of life is to fall in love with Krishna. Not that the goal of life is to drink beer and have a girlfriend and run around till four in the morning in London. You know, but the, the goal of life is to love Krishna and training for the next ashram, which for most people will be the Grahasta ashram. So that means training in your varna. Varna is career. Career is only applicable in the Grahasta ashram. Right? Brahmacharis don't have a career. Students don't have careers. Retired people don't have careers. And dead people don't have careers. <laughs> Those are the other three ashrams. Yes, Prabhu. I have a question from Mali Manahapu. Oh, that's pretty clever. <laughs> La when should ladies wear white? Yes. White. Ah, so when, so that would also be duties. older. Duties. And what are their duties? So that's asking about the duties of the Vanaprastha ashram. And uh, for the ladies to wear white means they've entered into the Vanaprastha ashram. So that might happen by the will of God if your husband dies when you're 22. And you're, you're, you're able to say, okay, I'm not going to marry again, which for a lot of women today, they're not able to do that. But, so that Krishna may uh, propel somebody into a renounced ashram at another time by his own will. But again, the decision should be made. I mean, Prabhupada says so the women marriage is 16, but let's say also 2025, 20, that the woman should also decide, am I going to marry or not? I mean, for the woman, it's really crucial because her biological clock is a little bit more finely tuned than that of the man. So if these women start saying, you know, at 2025, 20, oh, I don't know if I want to marry. Well, I don't know if I want to marry. Well, should I marry? Should I not marry? Should I marry? Should I not marry? You know? And then they're waiting till 30, 35. I mean, everywhere I go, everywhere I go, people ask me, can you find me a husband? Can you find me a wife? Yeah. And if the girl's 22, 23, it's pretty easy. But if she's 35, it's really hard. You know, I have a whole list. If any of you know any 40-year-old men who want to marry, I mean, I got a whole list of 35-year-old women. <laughs> See, I'm really serious. I have a whole list of them, you know, who are looking for good husbands. That they, you know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Yes! You know, I, I just had someone ask me, I really want a family. How old are you? 47. I said, it's too late. You know, it's done. So the women also should decide with proper guidance. Now, even fewer women can skip the grahasta ashram and skip varna than men can. So most men need to have a varna, and most men need to get married. What to speak of women? So it's very, 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 very rare. We've seen a few cases, really successful cases, of women who never, never had a varna and skipped the grahasta ashram. And at 45, 50, 55, they're balanced, happy, safe, stable, sane, people without regrets. You know, I've seen a few. But it's, it's unusual. So that should only be done at a young age with very careful counseling and mentoring and, and, and really deep introspection and prayer. Otherwise, around 45, 50, 55, same thing. You know, if the woman's younger than the man and the man is renouncing at 50, so the woman's going to be 40, 45, something like that. That would be the most appropriate. The duties, Prabhupada says, of those in the renounced order, he gives two main duties, to hold learned discourses, especially with devotees, and to produce literature. So that is the two main duties of those in the renounced order, to hold learned discourses and to produce literature. So that should be the primary duties. Other duties of those in the Vanaprastha ashram, whether male or female, to visit holy places, which includes the temples of the Hare Krishna movement. Um, for the women particularly, to dress very simply, I mean, Bhagavatam talks about dreadlocks and old torn clothing. I don't think that's very appropriate in modern society, but you know, you get the concept. So this is not the time to dye your hair blonde and have plastic surgery, et cetera, et cetera. 
<laughs> which people do if they inappropriately skip the Grahastha ashram, by the way. We see that. If people artificially skip the Grahastha ashram, all of a sudden you see this 45-year-old lady devotee and, oh, so, you know, we see that. All of a sudden they're wearing tight jeans and their hair is blonde and they look a little unusual. So this is the time for especially renunciation in clothing and especially renunciation for the Vanaprastas and sannyasis, something we do not do in the Hare Krishna movement. In what? What is the main area of austerity that one should do in the, in the Vanaprastha, particularly ashram? Eating. Eating. So there's four kinds of Vanaprastas given in the Bhagavatam and the differences between them are in how they get their food. How do they get their food? So especially eating, dress, uh, those things should be, there should be some austerity. The main um, occupation, dharma, in the Vanaprastha ashram is tapasya. But a tapasya that pleases Krishna. Tapaso ridayam sakshat atmaham tapaso. Lord, the Lord says to Brahma that tapasya is my, my very heart. Tapasa ridayam sakshat. Tapasya is my very heart. Atmaham tapasa. Tapasya is my very self. If someone's not willing to undergo tapasya, they have no business entering into a renounced ashram. That's the price for the freedom of the ashram. If you want the freedom of the ashram, the uh, requisite sacrifice is tapasya. Just like if you want the enjoyment of the grahasta ashram, the requisite sacrifice is charity. Uh, of, good, of good population, you, you give the good population to the society, and you give wealth to the society. So the duties are primarily some sort of austerity. So visiting holy places, some sort of austerity, uh, holding learned discourses, producing transcendental literature, you should become a teacher of the society. So all of those wonderful things you learned in the Brahmachari, Brahmacharini ashram, and Grahasta ashram, now you go and you teach. That's the idea. No. There may be also some bhajan and nandis who are just engaged in, you know, puja and, and study and like that. That might also be there, that they're, they're not such active preachers. But certainly in the Vanaprastha and Sannyasa ashram, the main thing you're giving up there is varna. There's no more varna. There's no more working to earn a livelihood. That's for the grahastha ashram. So that's the main thing that should be given up if it was there. One should be depending on Krishna and engage only in the processes of bhakti. One shouldn't be engaged in anything else. Of course, if the older Vanaprastha woman has uh, children, then she should be, if she's fortunate enough to have children, then she should also be under the protection of her children. If she has sons, under the protection of her sons. If she doesn't, then her son-in-law or sons-in-law. And she certainly can still be helping with the, with the family and being an instructor to the grown children and the grandchildren and, and so forth and so on. Yes? No, um, we more or less emphasizing on the Vanasham strictly, you know, the way you describe him. Yeah. Time. But then, what is the teaching of Chitama of the Buddha? In, if <coughs> someone is Krishna conscious, is, is that belong to any of those other Vanasham? Oh, I'm very sure nice. Let's look at the transcendental perspective that none of this has anything to, with, to do with me. So, Arvapati, Vinir Muktan, Tatpartain, and Nirmala, Rishikesh, Rishikina, Sevana, Bhakti, Ruchute. I don't have any of these designations. So, I don't see that we're doing these things because we're accepting the designations. We're doing them because it's Krishna's system, and it's very helpful. It's just like we could have this class out on the sidewalk. We could, but it would be very difficult. So, Having a building is, is easier. Is having a building necessary for bhakti? Do you need a building in order to achieve bhakti? No. But it's helpful. So do you need to follow the system of ashram and varna to be Krishna conscious? No, and it's not necessary at all. But it's Krishna's system. If you can do it, why not do it? If you can't do it, you know, if you're already 45 and you're thrice divorced and you have five kids by, you know, three different people, and forget it. It's, you know, you're not, it's, forget it. <laughs> what ashram am I in? I'm, you're not in an ashram. Just chant Hare Krishna. Plan B. <laughs> you know, I, Krishna will work with you on plan Z, you know. It's, it's, he's, a, he's a really good satnaf, and, and no matter how much you get off the track, he can, he can recalculate your route. But it's easier. It just makes it easier. So if you can do it, then do it. 
you know, if you can do it, do it. Don't intentionally not follow the Varna and Ashram system because you're so transcendental and then make your life difficult. I mean, if you're actually that transcendental and you're an avaduta, then that's another thing. But if you're not fully 100% transcendental and you have the opportunity to follow the system properly, why not? Why reject something that's helpful? It doesn't make sense. You know, you're supposed to accept what's favorable and reject what's unfavorable. If by the will of God and your karma, you, your life is a mess and you can't follow that system anymore, then, oh well, who cares? Bhakti is independent. You know, doesn't, and Bhakti's not dependent on these things. And at least as a society, Srila Prabhupada very much wanted that as a society, we facilitate these things. So as, a, as individuals, if somebody comes 45, tries to divorce with 10 kids by 10 different people, that's another thing. But as a society, we should be understanding what is the Brahmacharya Ashram, what is the Grahasta Ashram, what is the Vanaprasta Ashram, and assisting people. So at least as a society, we provide as close to the ideal as possible. So that when people join the Brahmacharya Ashram, they're getting specific training for a livelihood. To end. They're getting training in relationships. How am I going to have relationships in the Grahasta Ashram? They're getting training for a livelihood. And if it's obvious to the mentors and the guru and the person that they can skip the Grahasta Ashram and skip the Varnas, then they're getting training for how to be a Vanaprastha. Now, if we were giving training in our ashrams, I don't think we'd have empty ashrams. That's my own useless opinion. If you're offering something that's, that you're really training people, where people come out of, the, of that ashram, where you have a graduation ceremony, people have a deadline, they have to make a choice, they can't just go on and on and on until they're 45 and to make a choice. They have a deadline and there's real training and then there's a graduation ceremony and they don't feel like it's some kind of a fall down to go on to the next ashram. Then I think we wouldn't have a problem with people being very, very enthusiastic to come and enter the ashram like a college. It would be like a secondary school and like a college where you really get proper training and people can see the value of the training in their life and people would say, wow, you know, what I learned there in the Brahmacharya Ashram. And where we encourage people, you want to get something really radical, where we encourage people that after graduating and going on, that then you donate money back to the ashram, like you give money to your alma mater. So many, 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 many years ago, I asked Mahadudi Prabhu, I said, if anyone who's ever lived in the Soho Ashram for six months were to donate five pounds a month to the Soho Temple, would you have any financial problems? He said, no way. So if we train people like that, okay, you're getting this training and we don't even charge for it. We ask you to give service. You know, we, we don't even ask you to pay a fee. We ask you to live in the ashram and give service as your payment. But when you graduate, if you go to the Grahasta ashram and you get a varna, you get a career, then we expect you to give something, five, ten pounds a month until you enter the Vanaprasta ashram. And, and that would be a a very sane system whereby we could actually maintain our temples nicely and we could give people a high quality life. So at least on an institutional basis, it would be nice if we came as close to this as possible. And then when individuals can't work with it, we work with them. But we tell people, this is, it's just a, a frame. It's not, the, it's not the painting, it's just a frame. It just gives you a... a the, the beauty of the Varna Ashram system also is it teaches you how to spiritualize the conditioned part of your life. Like Prabhupada says in 930, that we all have two duties. We have constitutional duties and we have conditioned duties. So our constitutional duties are the nine angas of bhakti, the 64 angas of bhakti. Those are our constitutional duties. Those are the same for everybody, man, woman, child, old person, young, middle, whatever, whatever, your life cycle, whatever your occupation, doesn't matter. Everybody can chant Hare Krishna, everybody can remember Krishna, everybody can serve Krishna. But for most of us, that's not all we're doing. For most of us, we also have other interests, frankly. Most of us have interest in having a romantic relationship. Most of us have interest in having a career and doing something for the world. That's just the reality. Am I correct? Yes? And people ask all the time, how do I do that for Krishna? How do I spiritualize going to university? How do I spiritualize my job? How do I spiritualize my family? 
That's one of the main, like, top five questions that I get everywhere in the world. So the ashram and varna system is a, is a framework, it's a template, it's a model, how to do that. So that's very useful. Now, if you, if you don't use it, you can still spiritualize your, your life and your career, but it's harder because there's not a, a model. You have to just kind of figure it out. All right, well, how am I going to spiritualize this career? Well, how am I going to spiritualize this particular living situation? You, you just sort of have to um, ad-lib, you understand? You have to kind of make it up as you go. But if you can say, all right, I fit into this Varna. Oh, how do you spiritualize that Varna? There it is. How do you spiritualize that career? Oh, it's that, if that career fits into this Varna, there's, there's a way to spiritualize it. How do I spiritualize where I am in the life cycle? Oh, well, which ashram do I fit in? Oh, that's how to spiritualize it. So it's, it's very helpful for most people who, who cannot simply just hear and chant all day long. Is that all right? Did you have a question? I don't know if I'm ever going to get into these other three verses, but yes? One, one question. You know, Mother, you explained about the white, the white uh, rules for the Matajis. Uh-huh. Uh, is there any authority who will tell you what the age, because if the person is doing that... Just by the way, in the Bhagavatam, it says it's a saffron for the ladies. But go ahead. Uh, like, uh, if, if the lady is doing the activities you mentioned, like writing books or preaching, giving discourses, so why, why does he have to take any white? Oh, what's the necessity of external symbols yeah. in general? Why have any external symbols in general? Why doesn't everybody just do what they're doing without any symbols? That's a sociological question. So culture is, is uh, communicated and transmitted by six different things, and one of them is symbols. In every culture of the world, I don't care what culture it is, I don't care if it's a tribal culture in the Amazon, or a Nazi culture, or a British culture, or a Vedic culture, I don't care what culture it is. It's sociological, I'm a professor of sociology also. You, do you, I don't know if you know that. Okay, so, so there, there's six different ways that culture is transmitted, that culture is communicated, and one of them is through symbols. So if you don't purposely, intentionally take symbols, you'll, have, you'll get symbols anyway. There are symbolic ways of communication. And one symbol is clothing. So one friend of mine sent me a video recently where there was a sociological experiment where this one guy uh, dressed like a bum and he's walking on the streets of some city and then he stumbles and falls down and is lying on the street. And everybody just walks past him. Same person. They dress him up in a business suit with a briefcase. He walks on the same street, same place, stumbles, falls down, and immediately people rush to help him. So one symbol is clothing. Clothing indicates very much your varna, doesn't it? Don't we communicate our career by our clothing? Yes? Everywhere in the world. Some of that is practical. You know, if you're digging the ditches in the street or you're working on a computer, you obviously want to have some different clothing. But some of it is also symbolic. So we definitely have clothing that indicates various careers, at least, at least within broad demarcations. We also, frankly, even in our modern Western society, we have some clothing that indicates ashram. Do we have indications of being married? Do we have some symbolic thing that we wear that indicates whether or not we are married? A wedding ring for men and women, a wedding ring. There's a Western symbol. It's an article of clothing that we wear in the West to indicate I am married. Right? Like in India, they wear the sindoor and the bindi and the cover the head. Bangles. Yeah, well, it depends where you are. I mean, when my daughter moved to Govardhan, the ladies there said that because she's married, she had to cover her head, wear a cinder in her part, bindi on her forehead, bangles on her wrists, ankle bells on her ankles, and rings on her toes. Oh, and a Mangala Sutra. So she had a lot. You know, in the West, we're, we're a little bit more Spartan. We just have one little gold ring, but they have a whole, you know, head to, head to toe, to wherever, where, whatever part of the woman's body you look, 
You know, <laughs> if you look at her toes or you look at her hair or, either, or anything in between, you'll see that, oh, she's married, and then you'll look away. But that this kind of, <clears throat> this sort of symbol, we have symbols in the West if you're a religious person, yes? The minister, the priest, the nun. I was just in, in Italy where you see a lot of uh, nuns, more than I've, I see in any other place. So is there some indication? Why? Why? What's the necessity of symbols? You don't get confused. Yeah. You know who's who and what's what. I don't know if I should tell you this story. Obviously, I'm not going to do these other verses. Okay. All right, Krishna. Surrender. Tomorrow you can adjust. I had a whole class plan, but anyway, that's all right. So last time I was visiting London, I walked down the street. I went, I was buying some soap in one shop here. And the person who was helping me, I could not figure out if, it, if this person was male or female. I just couldn't figure it out <laughs> at all. I think, it's a man. No, it's a woman. It's a man. Woman? Man? Woman? Man? And the person had a little name tag on, but I couldn't tell from the name either. I couldn't tell from the voice. I couldn't tell. If, if it was a man, it would, be a, it would have been a young man, maybe like 18. I just simply could not tell. And when I, when I left the shop, I thought... Why did it matter? I mean, I was just buying some soap. What do I care if the person selling me soap is male or female? And I, because it was constantly, constantly in my mind. It's a man. No, it's a woman. No, it's a man. No, it's a woman. No, it's, no, no, it's got to be a woman. No, it's not. It's a man. No, it's a woman. And when I, when I, what I realized was I behave differently. I act differently. If I'm talking to a man, there's certain ways I simply just don't behave. There's certain ways I'll behave with women. I just do not behave like that with men. I have different behaviors. Yes? I, I, didn't, I don't think I was ever that aware of it until that incident. That there has to be some bandha. Before there can be abhide and priyojana, there has to be some bandha. You have to know your relationship. How do you, you don't know how to behave with somebody unless you know their identity. Okay, that's all false identity. Thank you for our transcendental viewpoint. But still, there's for social dealings in the world, you have to know the false identity also. So, Vijavanai Sampane Brahmani Gavi Hasni Suni Chavasapake Pandita Samadarshina. Okay, so you see that the Brahman and the dog are equal in spiritual identity, but you also have to notice the false identity. It would be a little useful, yes? My dear dog, come and worship the deity. You know, you, you need to have. That also has to be known. And so these symbols immediately communicate. Otherwise, it's a little awkward. Um, excuse me. Um, are you male or female? <laughs> yeah, it was just, I could never ask the question. You know, um, are you married or not? What are you? You know, as soon as we know the relationship, then we know how to behave. We have a standard for how to behave. So these, these things are communicated symbolically. Not always. You have Jed Bharat, who is just looking like a deaf, dumb, blind person, and so he wasn't recognized. So there are some avadutas who don't accept any symbols. But dress is not the only symbol. The seat is a symbol, and there's so many symbols. Once you start looking for them, you'll notice that we communicate culture and etiquette and relationships symbolically all the time. Our tilak is a symbol, our ethics is a symbol. I mean, they have particular functions. They're not only symbolic, but they're also a symbol. And they are, the symbol has relevance for the person also. You feel differently when you wear blue jeans and you wear a business suit, don't you? Yes? Don't you feel different? It affects how you behave. It doesn't just affect how other people treat you. It affects how you behave. So, I mean, I, I have practical personal experience that uh, going from the Grahasta Ashram to the Vanaprasta Ashram. And although there was a particular date at which my husband took Vanaprasta and, and we entered into the Vanaprasta Ashram, I mean, it happened at, at one particular time, at a particular day. I saw that there was also a sandhya. You know what a sandhya is? 
like a dawn or a twilight, there was a juncture. Like the sannyas ashram, you can enter it gradually, like first you get a house outside the village and your children bring you food and, you know, <laughs> there, there's different stages of sannyas. So I saw, we, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of guidance. I think we were some of the first in the movement to do that. We took Vanaprastha in 96. But I saw that naturally that Krishna guided me through a kind of progression. And one of those progressions was in clothing. So I don't know if I should be so personal. But anyway, I will. You ask the question, why not? I don't mind. So at first, you know, I had bangles. I immediately took them off and I gave them to my daughter. And then when I joined the movement, I had pierced my ears up here and I would pierced my nose. I used to wear a great big nose ring with a chain. So I gave, I took those earrings out. I gave that to my daughter-in-law. I gave them, I gave away my nose ring. So I still had two earrings here. I made them simple. And then I started wearing white with, I didn't know what to wear. And I wasn't really aware then that the Bhagavatam says to wear fire-colored clothing. So anyway, I started wearing white with a border. But I had some saris already that were white with a border. So they were nice. They were still my grahasta ashram saris. They just happened to be white with a border. But so I wore that. You know, and, and then gradually, 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 like I, I would take off my earrings and then I'd feel naked. Like it says in the Bhagavatam, for the married woman, she shouldn't go out without being properly ornamented. And I was trained like that from my mother. You don't go out of the house without being ornamented. You know, you're not. So it was very hard. If I went out without earrings, I was like, I'm naked. You know, I, just, I couldn't do it. It was really difficult. And so I would take them out, put them back, take them out. And they were really, really simple. And then at one point I thought, why am I going all over the world with these little pieces of gold? So one day I just finished. And then Krishna also helped because I'm traveling with one little suitcase. So one little suitcase, you only have three sets of clothes. And I get these practical clothes that don't need to be ironed and they dry quickly. And so they all look the same. I mean, right now they have three different borders. Sometimes they all have the same borders. I don't even know what I'm wearing. I just wear the same three sets of clothes over and over and over and over. They're not torn, like it says in the Bhagavatam, although I could do that, I suppose. And then you reach a point you just don't care anymore. I don't even know what I'm wearing. The end of the day when I go to bed, it's like, which, which color border did I have on? I don't even know. It doesn't even matter anymore. And when I was doing this, God, I'm going to be really honest here. Is that okay that I'm being honest and personal? Is that helpful? I don't want to do this if it's not helpful. So it was when I was going through the earring thing, particularly, I remember when I was going through that. Should I wear them? Should I not wear them? Should I wear them? Should I not wear them? And then I thought, why is it that a woman wants to look attractive? Why, why do I have this inner desire to look physically attractive? What, what's it coming from? What is it? What's going on here? And I realized it's, it's lust. It's just lust. And why does a woman want to look attractive? So she can, control, can, she can control the men through lust, and she can control the women through envy. Because women are attracted to beautiful women too, right? Yes, the women's magazines, they're not full of pictures of men. You notice that? The men's magazines are full of pictures of women, and the women's magazines are full of pictures of women. It's an interesting phenomena. So I realized it was, it was nasty, it was evil that my desire to be attractive was evil. It was exploitive, it was nasty, it was dirty. And part of how you give that up is by accepting the symbols, you follow? It pushes you to that place. You know, okay, you're, you're, you're supposed to stop caring about, and Prabhupada talks about this in the fourth canto, he says as a woman stops combing her hair, that her, her lust goes away, why? It's very connected. When you give up that idea, and of course old age helps too. You, know, you look in the mirror and you're like, it's a lost cause. <laughs> and then you find this wonderful freedom that once you stop trying to exploit other people and control other people, that you end up with the, well, not wonderful relationships. I love it that men aren't like funny around me anymore. I really like it. It's, it's, it's like, oh, thank God. Yeah, it's over. You know, and you, 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 but that's, you're pushed to that through the symbols also for the person. 
when you make your eating austere, when you make your clothing austere, when you, you make your money austere, when you make your living facility austere, when you take those symbols, you can't do them peacefully if you're in the old mentality. You just can't. You go crazy. So it, 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 it's such a scientific thing, you see? It's all very scientific and very helpful. And it, it forces you to look in the heart and say, why was I attached to those things? What was I getting out of it? What evil thing was in my heart? Does that all make sense? And if you, bhakti is bhakti is bhakti is bhakti is bhakti. And just chanting Hare Krishna will do all that no matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter. If I was chanting Hare Krishna, even if I was wearing silk saris with jari and whatever, Krishna would still be cleaning my heart just by chanting Hare Krishna. But why not? Why not? If there's something that will help you, why not do it? And then it reminds you, this is my duty. This, this is my service to Krishna right now. This is what I'm working on. It's extremely, extremely helpful. And I don't, I don't see why not to do it. Is that all right? It's a long answer, but um, yes. Why do you think it's not standard for young women as well? Why do you think it's not standard for young women as well? Everything that you described, simple clothes. Because that's not what they're capable of doing. That's the whole point of this verse. Kalap yantam. According to time, kale at the suitable time. You have to do the suitable thing at the suitable time. The right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. The, the right time is part of sattva gun. The sannyas ashram is the best ashram. If you tell everyone to take sannyas when they're 10 years old, you'll have chaos in society. Radhakund is the best place. Does that mean all of us should go live at Radhakund? What's best is what's best for an individual at a particular time. That's sattva gun. So how does the woman deal with that when she's a young woman? How does the woman deal with lust when she's a young woman? What is the prescribed method for a woman dealing with lust when she's a young woman? Get married and have babies. Babies are a great cure for lust, my dear friend. One of the best cures that I know. It's very nice to see your body as a baby-making and baby-feeding machine rather than as an attracting men machine. So that's, that's the, for the young woman, that's the prescribed thing. For the young woman, she's supposed to dress beautifully for the husband, not for the public. That's the, the injunction. Why? Because she's going to want to dress nicely anyway. <laughs> oh, then maybe she's a brahmana. But even the brahmin uh, wives at the yagya were dressed nicely. Because she, she, she dresses nicely for her husband, but her husband's not the only one seeing her. And also she doesn't want to unnecessarily agitate her husband's mind towards her body. Anyway, Bhagavatam. I'm just saying Bhagavatam. <laughs> Bhagavatam says the woman should dress nicely for her husband. And the Bhagavatam doesn't say that only applies to the Kshatriya women. You know, that's the Bhagavatam. So that's why. Then the, the man is also happy. Oh, I have a beautiful wife. And then he's not going to go look elsewhere. And the woman is happy. I have some man who loves me and thinks I'm beautiful. And she'll be peaceful. These things, again, are very, very scientific. If they're, if they're brahmanas, just like Prabhupada saw Ravinda Sri Prabhu's uh, daughter when she was young, and she was wearing lots and lots of jewelry, and Prabhupada said, oh, she should be married to a ksatriya. Then she started reciting Bhagavad Gita slokas. He said, no, she should be married to a brahmana. <laughs> so there are differences. You know, if you're, if you're a brahmana couple, naturally you're going to be more simple and austere than if you're a ksatriya or a vaisha couple. That, that's, there's going to be individual differences, or if your husband says, I hate jewelry, then you don't wear any. I mean, it, it's, I know some woman whose husband said, I hate jewelry, I just can't stand it. So that's another thing. But there's, look, these are all material. 
But as long as we have some material identification of material body, then we take the medicine for our individual circumstance. Therefore, Krishna says, better to do your own duty, even if imperfectly, than someone else's duty perfectly. For to follow another's path is dangerous. To, to be a grahasta when you're 70 or to be a vanaprasta when you're 20 is not good for most people. Maybe for somebody, but not generally. Does that make sense? So just like, you know, you go to the doctor, and you, if it's a good doctor, like an Ayurvedic doctor, they'll give you different medicines for different stages of your disease or different physical therapies. Recently I went through some physical therapy that really helped me. And Okay, start with these exercises. Then after you do these exercises, you get to this point of health. Then you can do these exercises. But don't do them too soon. They said, don't be in a hurry and you do them too soon. And then after you get those, and then, then you go on to the next set of exercises. So there's so many medicines in the pharmacy. Which medicine is right for me? The, the way that you're renounced in the Brahmacharya ashram is very different from the way you're renounced in the Grahastha ashram. It's not the same. Although you're, both of them, you're renounced and you're dedicating everything to Krishna. But it's very, very different. The external manifestations is very different. So the main point here is proper time, proper time, proper time. Krishna is setting the example here of doing things at the proper time. And this whole section, even in the, we just read 32, which had this nice purport, but in 31 also, some places he's planning battles, some places he's making peace. Reminds me of the verse from Ecclesiastes. You know, to everything there is a time, to everything there is a season. Jai Deutsch Marsh has written a commentary on Ecclesiastes. There's a time for war, there's a time for peace, there's a time to plant, there's a time to reap. You know, everything has its time. And being in Satvagun, see when you're in, in, in Tamagun, especially in Tamagun to some extent in Rajagun, you try to force things. Hiranyakashipu did this. Hiranyakashipu forced all of the plants to bear fruit and flowers all year, regardless of the season. He was, it was forcing. But in Satvagun you don't force. In Satvagun you work in harmony. You work in balance. You see what are the seasons. When the mode of goodness is active, you wake up and you chant. When the mode of ignorance is active, you go to sleep. When the mode of passion is active, you do your career or you do active service for Krishna. When you're young, you go to school. When you're in midlife, you have a job and a, and a, and a family. When you're older, you retire. When you're older, older, you die before dying. You prepare for death. Everything in the proper time. Uh, Ayurveda is all based on seasons. What different food you eat in different seasons. What you do at the different time of the day. The best food is that which is grown locally according to season and you pick it off the tree instead of flown in from Chile when it's the wrong season here. So this being in, in harmony and doing things at the proper time. There's a time for war, there's a time for peace. There's a time when a woman should dress gorgeously with beautiful jewelry and there's a time when she should give all of her jewelry away and wear old torn clothing. And each thing has its proper time. And doing the right thing at the wrong time is ignorance. If you give charity to the right person, but you do it at the wrong time, that is charity in the mode of ignorance. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If someone's sitting on the toilet and you give them a donation, <laughs> that's the mode of ignorance, even though they may be a saintly person. Excuse me, saintly person. Can, oh, that reminds me of a story that Burjan Prabhu was taking photographs for Back to Godhead and he was taking photographs of Srila Prabhupada for Back to Godhead. He was running around with a camera. So I think they were at Nuvrindavan. I don't remember where they were. And, and Prabhupada has his, his Brahmin thread around his ear and he's carrying a load and he's walking out into the field and Burjan Prabhu is running after him with a camera. <laughs> and Prabhupada turns around and says, not now. <laughs> so we should know what is the proper time. Everything has its time. And we should understand what is, what is this time meant for? What is this time meant for? And let me use it accordingly. And that we understand not by speculation, but through Sadhu Shastra Guru. So according to Shastra Guru, this time of my life, this time of the day, this time of the season, this time in terms of my particular interactions, how do I serve Krishna in this time? What is the best thing to do in this time? And that may be opposite. One place Krishna is planning battles, in one place 
he is making peace. One time it's time to sleep, one time it's time to wake up. And when we work in, in harmony, like Prabhupada says, the world is full of Krishna's singing. And Krishna's dancing, we're dancing with Krishna or we're dancing separately. So singing in Ayurveda, you know, there's different ragas and talas for different times. For different times. So the world is full of Krishna's singing. And we are meant to sing with Krishna. Now, how are we going to sing with Krishna? How are we going to harmonize my singing with Krishna's singing? I have to know what he's singing, don't I? He's not always singing the same thing. So that's according to the time. Krishna called the gopis to the Raslila, and when it was over, it was the Brahma Hurti. He told them to go home, and they went home. You understand? When the Brahmin cursed Mars Brickett, he says, huh? The songs changed. Krishna's changed the melody. Time to renounce. Huh? Prabhupada saw this devotee who'd gotten a little fat, and he said, You shouldn't eat so much. He said, but Prabhupada, you told me to eat a lot. He said, did you believe me then? He said, so believe me now. Shri Prabhupada, Ki Jai.